It's a good thing God is faithful. Especially in light of our sometiming faithfulness to him. We need him to establish order within our relationship and maintain that order, maintain that relationship with his faithfulness. Well, I want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning, and we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 18. Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 18. And uh, I will pray, and then we will read this. Father, we come to your word, and we ask that you would speak through it, that the Holy Spirit that inspired the writing would inspire the illumining of our minds, the understanding of our hearts, the moving of our disposition, the changing of our affections, that we might love you more and be changed by what it says. Father, we don't come to study, we come to be changed. And help us to walk away different people after having been exposed to you and your word in this way. We ask that you would help us with our weak and feeble minds that, first of all, we're weak in writing the sermon, and secondly, are weak in hearing it. We all need your help. And so we ask that you would be merciful in this way to us. We pray these things in our Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. So as you're in Exodus chapter 20, start with 18, if you wouldn't mind rising with me as you are able, and we're going to read from 18 to 24. This is God's word. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. That's the word of God. You may be seated. Now, you have heard this before, uh, if you were here last time I preached, because it's the exact same passage. And that's why this is called part two. And um, we're in Exodus 20. We're considering these verses. And these are, the, these are the verses that show the people's response to the Ten Commandments while they were at the base of Mount Sinai. Um, However, this is not the whole biblical picture of what happened there. The book of Hebrews wants Christians to consider what happened on this day in light of what happened after Jesus has established his covenant. And it does this in a comparison. It does it in a comparison of images, the image of Mount Sinai, which I just read, and the image of Mount Zion, which is referenced in Hebrews chapter 12. And so what this, this is our path this morning. I, we're going to knock some of the rust off so you remember what we said last time, a short review over what we just read, and then we're going to go to Hebrews 12, and then we're going to take a look at what, how Hebrews 12 looks back at the activity on Mount Sinai, okay? So uh, just as a reminder, if you, uh, in, in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, God proposed that, that he would have a covenant to Moses, go see if the people want to be in covenant with me. They can be my special treasure. They will be a kingdom of priests. They will be a holy nation. And, and that would let all, they would lead all the other nations to the Lord. That's the offer. Moses goes to the people, and they jumped on that heartily. They said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And, and when he came, after much preparation, God comes into the scene with smoke, with fire, with thunder, with trembling earth, and, and this intensified God gives the Ten Commandments. And the pressure 
of, of what was happening that day was overwhelming. The presence of God was terrifying. The Ten Commandments were overwhelming. The scene was awesome, both before, while getting the Ten Commandments, and after receiving the Ten Commandments, the whole thing was just very, very overwhelming. And, and in this, the people came to realize that God is not safe, but he is significant. And, and this is what it partly means to see the glory of God. They didn't see God, but they saw a portion of his significance. They saw an, a, a small amount of his weight. They saw some of his glory. And this is one of those times in history where God lets a supernatural portion of who he is be seen and heard and felt. Now, they were terrified at that. And we said last time there are two ideas that had them terrified. First of all, they definitely saw a difference between them and their God. There's a difference between the creature and the creator, right? And they saw that significantly. And, and he, God was more than they ever imagined when he showed up like that. But secondly, when they heard the law and his Ten Commandments, they recognized that he is a moral God who's requiring moral things out of them and that every part of their life had to be shaped by God's morality. He was requiring holiness out of them in everything. And at that point, the people immediately turned to Moses and said, you've got to protect us. Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. We'll do anything you say, but don't let God speak to us again, or we will die. They didn't want God to meet with them like that again. They needed someone to stand between God and themselves, and Moses could represent God to them, and he could represent them to God. And, and so they rejected the idea that they were going to relate to God like what just happened. Now, last time I represented that as a good thing, but there's something not quite right about that. <clears throat> they should recognize the difference between them and a holy God. As unholy people, they ought to have some concerns that they had. And calling for a mediator was a good instinct. And in verse 20, Moses tries to, to kind of calm their hysteria, and his first instruction is, don't be afraid. And the reason you don't have to be afraid is because the Lord is here to test you, not to destroy you. You feel like you're going to be destroyed, but he's not here to destroy you. He's here to test you. However, let the fear of God remain with you. And last time we, we thought about how ironic this is that, that, that he says, fear not, but let the fear remain. And, and we recognize the fact that there's an un, unproductive emotional terror that is not good, and there is a productive fear of the Lord that allows you to live with God and obey him, that is good. And so the pr productive fear will promote holiness, reverence, and worship. And that's right, and it's helpful, and we ought to fear the Lord that allows us to live our lives as well as relate to God with him in respect to who he is. That's a good fear. And verse 21 we see that Moses does what a good mediator does. He approached God because the people wouldn't. The, a biblical mediator enters God's presence on behalf of the people of God. And while everybody else in Israel was trembling with fear, Moses goes up alone to meet with God and, and to receive the rest of God's law. We're going to see there's more, there's more law to come. And that's what happened that day. That was significant, and it was etched in Jewish memory, and it was very clearly retold throughout the ages. The story of that day's events, the coming of the Lord, the beginning of the covenant with Mo of Moses, and the receiving of the Ten Commandments, that whole story was retold a thousand times over. And scripture goes on to talk about that as well. And I don't think we're going to understand exactly what happened that day, exactly what it truly meant, if we don't consider what was said about that day in Hebrews chapter 12. So I'm going to ask you to flip to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today for the most part. Now, as you're turning, let me remind you of something. You're flipping your Bible about 1,800 years going from Exodus to Hebrews, 1,800 years, and, and you're going from a land that was controlled by the Egyptian empire to another land that's under the Roman empire. 
And the author of Hebrews, who we're not certain who it is, I'm not supposed to say these things. I think it was Paul, but we don't, we don't know. I'll give some other day, I'll tell you why I think that, but I'm just, I'm just going to say I think it was Paul, but I'm not certain, okay? Now, the author of Hebrews is addressing a situation which he believes there are people of Jewish background who have joined the Christian church. Okay, now think about this. They were born into Jewish heritage and converted to Christianity in some way. That's not a surprise to us. We've seen it happen in the Acts as pastors have been going through that. Jews are becoming Christians, right? Well, well, this particular, within that group, there are some of the Jews who are thinking about going back to Judaism. Okay? Now, this is a time in which the Romans recognized and made room for Jews to live within the empire. The empire was so great, all kinds of people lived there, and Jews were allowed to live there, right? However, Christians were kind of an unknown faith. Because at first they seemed to be a subset of the Jews. All the Christians seemed to, at first, have Jewish background. And so to a Roman, it looked like, man, eh, it's Jews, right? They're just a little different. Well, as time goes on, what you find out is the Jews aren't having these Christians. They're getting run out of the synagogues. And not only that, the, the Christians don't have Jewish habits. And so it becomes obvious that this might have looked like it started a Jewish thing, but these people are not Jewish, right? And in the Roman Empire at this time, you, you could have the freedom in some ways with restrictions to worship the way you wanted. Jews were illegal. However, in the local scene, you might abuse some Jews. You might take advantage of them. You might deal with somebody who's weird, like Christians. And if a plague comes through and people start dying, you start looking for people you can blame. Blame the Christians, blame the Jews. And it's pretty clear through the records that's the kind of things that would happen, right? And so while there is some legal protection, on the ground, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Persecutions used to happen all the time within the Roman Empire. It's not till later that they get empire-wide, but local problems were always there, right? And so, so um, Hebrews 11 describes at the end how there were some Christians who were martyred by the Roman Empire for believing in Christ, right? And so therefore, it's possible for a Christian of Jewish heritage who has connected himself with the church to maybe rethink his Christianity and say, you know what, being a Christian here is not comfortable. It's not helpful. I'm not moving forward. As a matter of fact, I'm threatened. And he could decide to go back to Judaism. Persecution could do that to you, right? So the book of Hebrews seems to be written to those people considering recanting their Christian commitment, recanting their Christian commitment, and returning to the Judaism they once held. And the author of Hebrews says that's a mistake. That's a huge mistake. Because Christ and the things that are Christian are superior to the Old Covenant. Amen. Why go back to Judaism when Christianity is so much better? And I'm not trying to insult Jews when I say that, but, but the author of Hebrews says that there's a better revelation about God. <laughs> Christian, Christ is better than, than any revelation about God you've ever seen. He's a physical representation of God. And, and what, about, what about him as a, a messenger from God? He's better than the angels. Yeah. And what about a priest? He's better than all the Old Testament priests. And what about the sacrifices? His sacrifice is better than theirs. Amen. And so turning back from the new covenant to the old is a huge loss. And since Christ has come, there is no salvation back there. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 3. He said, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son. Amen. Right? And so Hebrews 12 is really the capstone part of the argument of the book of Hebrews. Because for 11 chapters, the author is building this one argument. Christ is superior to that. Christ is superior to that. Christ is superior to that. And he gets to, verse, he gets to, to 12, and he, he wants to compare one covenant, the old covenant, to another covenant, the new covenant. And he does it by representing them as mountains. Okay, mountains. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 18, and I'm going to read 18 to 21, and this is going to describe the first mountain. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched 
into a blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind, into a blast of the trumpet and the sound of words, which sound is such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am, I am full of fear and trembling. That's the first mountain. Do you recognize it? That's Mount Sinai, isn't it? And we know what he's talking about. He's looking back on that day in Exodus chapter 20 when the Ten Commandments were given, and he's caught the threatening sensory overload of having God reveal his glory. He's caught the threat of disobeying God, a mountain that cannot be touched. They couldn't touch the mountain because God's presence consecrated it and set it apart from sinful people. And there was a death sentence even for animals that touched the mountain. And the severity of this command demonstrated the costliness of uncleanness in front of a holy God. And Moses said, it was so bad that I was full of fear and trembling myself. All right. However, look back at how verse 18 starts. It says, for you have not come to this mountain. See, Exodus 20 described the Hebrew Old Covenant experience. However, that's not the Christian New Covenant experience. If you are a Christian, you should not see yourself in a situation at the bottom of Mount Sinai, a very tangible place, in terror, begging for Moses to stop God from talking again. That isn't who you are, Christian. It isn't where you are. The word not in verse 18 is key to understanding the differences between our experience with God and Israel's experience with him. Not draws a contrast between the old and new covenants. Not draws a contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. So that's the point. If we're not at Mount Zion, uh, excuse me, at Mount Sinai, where are we? Verse 22 tells us where we're at. We, but you have come to Mount Zion. That's our mountain. And, and if you are in Christ, you're at a different mountain than Sinai. You're at Mount Zion. And I want to take a minute on Mount Zion because you might wonder, why is a Christian at, Mount, at a mountain at all? <laughs> what are we doing there? And what does it mean that we are Christians are at Mount Zion? And, and let's start with what is Mount Zion, right? Well, Mount Zion first gets mentioned in 2 Samuel Chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. In this situation, David has been made king over all of Israel. But his capital is in a city called Hebron. It's not in Jerusalem yet. And the reason it's not is because there was people named the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. Therefore, part of solidifying the country included David capturing Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel 5, that's what he does. It says, Now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites and the inhabitants of the land, and they said to David, You shall not come in here, but the blind and lame, blind and lame will turn you away, thinking David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, the city of David. Now, what that is is the, the Jebusites are inside the city, and David's on the outside trying to take the city, and the Jebusites are making fun of him. He says, hey, this is no problem, David. You're not coming in here. Our handicapped people will keep you out of here, right? And, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. The blind and the lame didn't keep him out, and the healthy people didn't keep him out. David overran the city, and it becomes known as the city of David. And, and if, you, if the geography of the place is that Jerusalem's pretty much a small town at this point when David takes over. It's not that great yet. And it sits on a couple of ridges in the mountains. And one of these ridges is called Zion, right? And it's a real place. As a matter of fact, you can put it in Google Maps and find it right now. It's a, and, and this small town of Jerusalem becomes a city as it becomes the capital city. However, in the Bible, Zion becomes much more than a part of real estate in Jerusalem, the capital city. Mount Zion eventually gets so identified with Jerusalem, it becomes synonymous with the city itself. In fact, you could say Mount Zion and you meant Jerusalem. You could say Jerusalem and you meant Mount Zion, right? It, it works either way. Well, David's in a, David and his sons rule as kings there, and their, their rule is established on Mount Zion. Psalm 48, 1 and 2 says, Great is the Lord, 
and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth. It is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Now that sounds like what somebody might poetically write about their capital city, right? Very proud, uh, patriotic about it. And, and the king is in reference to David as well as David's children, his sons who ruled there as king. And, and Zion is the place from where the king ruled. But notice it's also called holy here. And that's because Solomon built his temple right on Mount Zion. It's where the, it's where the temple stood. And so Zion not only becomes where the holy king rules, but also it becomes the center of worship. And therefore, Mount Zion not only takes on political importance, it takes on spiritual significance, and, and it becomes to actually outstrip, its reputation outstrips what it really is. Listen to Psalm 132, verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion, and he has desired it for his habitation. Okay, so not only does the king live there, the Lord lives there, right? It's, it's one thing to say that the king lives there and the temple is there. It's another thing to say the Lord is located there, all right? Now, the legend of Zion grows. Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2 says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, this psalm's a well-known prophecy. It, com it comes to be, by the, in, the old, in the New Testament, it comes to be one of the more important prophecies, uh, not to compare one to another, but it's at least the most mentioned prophecy in the New Testament. And if it's, it's, it's critical, and one of the reasons it's critical is because this indicates Zion is the place where the Messiah is expected to rule from. And so you can see Zion is growing in its reputation and expectations. But, but Zion, it actually occupies two realities. It has spiritual significance, but it's actually a real place. And this real place could be threatened. In Obadiah 16 and 17, it says, because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if, the, if they never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, and it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. See, Jerusalem is going to get attacked by Babylonians, and, and Jerusalem is going to be overrun. And yet, this is a promise that Zion is going to be reestablished. The people of God will have their promised land. The Messiah will have his seat. And if you jump ahead out of the Old Testament into the New Testament, we see that in Jesus' day, Jerusalem was known by these promises. Matthew 5, 34 and 35 say this. This is, this is Jesus speaking. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now think about that. Jesus calls Jerusalem the city of the great king. But what is actually going on at this time? <laughs> at this time, they're under the control of the Roman Empire. And, and so you might look at Jesus' time, you might look back in history and say, yeah, this is the city of the great king, and you're thinking about David and some of his sons, perhaps. Or you could call Jerusalem the city of the great king and look forward and say, this is where the Messiah is going to come from. But you couldn't really consider Jerusalem the city of the king right then, when Jesus was speaking. And, and yet under the Romans, under that kind of control, there is still history and hope tied to Mount Zion. Isaiah 2 predicts a lot of what I'm talking about. It, it says a lot about Mount Zion. Listen to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, The word of the, which, which, excuse me, let me start over. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will become about that in the last days, the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and we may walk in his paths. 
For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and render decisions for many people. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never will they learn war again. This is predictive. As it said, it's a remarkable thing that's going to happen in these last days. Zion is the center of the Lord's work. It's from where he works. And the people around the world are going to look there for discipleship and obedience to God. And it will be a place of God's rule and God's justice. And that's going to ensure that it's also a place of peace. And what happens at Mount Zion in the last days is obviously prophecy. And it gets crazier than this at the end of Isaiah. In chapter 66, verses 20 and 21, this idea could have never, never have caught traction with the Jews. I mean, think about this. It says, Then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and litters, on mules and on camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, so will I also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. Now think about this. Jews are separated from Gentiles by law. And yet here, Gentiles are being received to God as brothers. Now, how can Gentiles be brothers to Jews? That's impossible. And this describes what these brothers do as they come to the holy mountain of Sinai. And then it gets crazier, because not only are there brethren from other nations, God is going to use them as priests and Levites, giving them access to him full access to him as a priest or a Levite. Now, that's unheard of. How can a Gentile become a Levite? That's impossible under Moses' covenant. Yet Isaiah said that's when it, what's going to happen when the people of God come to him at Zion. So, so what we're left with is, is that Zion is a place, but it's a picture of something more than a place. It's a picture of a very different world among the biblical prophets. They look back on the good old days of David's reign as a golden age, but they also look forward to when that golden age is going to be reestablished and then even surpassed beyond all logic, right? And, and so when you consider all that Mount Zion represented in Scripture to this point, you can understand why Hebrews 12, 18 says, you've come to a mountain that cannot be touched. It's a real place that can be touched, but it represents everything that can't be touched, right? The mountain signifies the ultimate rule of God that brings his rule into actuality around the world. It's not just a mountain. It's the complete success of salvation. That's what it stands for. And in that sense, it holds a promise out that hasn't been completely filled in that day of the Hebrews, nor in our day today. We wait in hope for the truths promised at Mount Zion, or excuse me, Mount Zion, to be realized in the fullest sense. And Christian, if you are in Christ, that's where you are. That's where you are. Amen. And so when the writer goes on to describe Zion with more detail, it's a physical city with very spiritual qualities. Verse 22 says, we've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. All right. Now you see, again, the mountain and the city described together, the same thing. And that makes sense, because Jerusalem encompasses Mount Zion. And you can talk about the mountain, you can talk about the city, you're talking about the same piece of geography. But this is God's city in a specific way, and he's made some particular claims about it. Moreover, the writer calls it a heavenly Jerusalem. And, and I want to hang on to this for a second, because we've got to get something straight right now, or we're going to have problems in the rest of Exodus. Okay, and, and we got to get this straight because we tend to think the opposite, all right? And, and what we need to get in our heads is that things that are heavenly are more significant and more real than the things you find on earth. Amen. Okay, now we've been trained the opposite. Uh -huh. We've been mistrained in how we think about this. We think that when somebody says something spiritual, something is spiritual, that it's light it's airier than a physical thing. 
We think that heaven is lighter and airier than earth is. It's just the opposite. Physical, earthly things are tiny, wispy, light, temporary, they rust, they leak, and they're weak. <laughs> Spiritual, heavy things are massive, dense, incorruptible, and permanent. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now think about your bodies for a minute. You think your body is strong and good looking, right? You know what, you know what scripture calls your body? It's a tent. It's a tent. It's flimsy and light. It can barely hold your spirit. In fact, your spirits are so real that they're only going to stay in that tent for maybe a few decades. In fact, your spirits are so real that they're going to last and never deteriorate, and they're going to run through this tent like you can't imagine. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says we're looking forward to getting rid of these earthly tents and getting into a heavenly body that can handle a real spirit. And when the Christian is buried and put into the ground, that is something perishable. That is something dishonorable, and that is something weak. And when the Christian gets his new body, that is something that is imperishable, glorious, and powerful. We misunderstand this idea of spiritual. I, even in angels, I say the word angels, and you think of little fat babies with harps on clouds. That's not what an angel is. You're thinking about Casper the ghost. That's not what an angel is. When angel appears in scripture, they are so overwhelming, people run for their lives. Every time an angel shows up, the first thing he has to say is, wait, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Most of the time they come, they come as warriors. Spiritual things, heavenly things, are always more significant and always more glorious than physical earthly things. And if we don't get that straight, we're going to screw up this life because we're going to be trying to put patchwork on earthly things that are meant to deteriorate. Therefore, when the author speaks of a heavenly Jerusalem, he means something much more substantial than the city you can now visit in the Middle East. It's the city of God in the sense that that's where God chooses to manifest himself, his reign and his rule. Even as Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel, so the heavenly Jerusalem is the expression of God's rule over everything. And now we see that the writer of Hebrews has made a subtle shift. He's not only talking about nominal Christians that might not, might not stick with Christianity, he's describing eternal realities that these people are forfeiting. He's writing about the eternal ramifications of what they're doing. He's speaking about it in end time language. Listen to John describe part of his vision in Revelation 12, or excuse me, 21 2. He said, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. That Jerusalem is more significant than the Jerusalem you can visit today. Listen to it again in Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven from God. This is where God rules. While Mount Zion's a place on earth, Hebrews is describing a heavenly reality that's much more important, and it's where God eternally rules. Okay? Now, the author does something interesting. He's going to describe Mount Zion, but he's going to describe it by who's there. Okay, and he's going to go through a list of who's there at Mount Zion. He's already said, Christian, you're there. Well, who's there with you? And the first thing he says is there are a myriad of angels. Now, a myriad is a very large, practically uncountable number. It just means many, 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 many. It usually talks in terms of thousands, thousands, and thousands, and thousands. But it's large and uncountable, basically. And Revelation 5, 11 captures the same idea. John's, again, trying to describe what he sees in heavenly things. And he says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. That's a lot. I don't know how many, but it's a lot, right? And, and so there's a huge, at Mount Zion, there's a huge, uncountable number of angels living there. Now, as I said before, angels usually show up as warriors. They're usually threatening, not these angels. These angels are wearing festival or celebration clothes. 
They're not there to attack, they're there to have a party. They're celebrating. And that's good. <laughs> you, it, it, armies are threatening. Angels that are celebrating is good, right? Now, it doesn't tell you why they're celebrating. There's not a specific reason why they're celebrating. You get the impression that, that the celebration is just what they do in Mount Zion in general. And the author is saying, Christian, you come to a mountain where there are countless angels celebrating. And there are people there as well, 22 to the, or excuse me, 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Well, okay, it's talking about people here, right? Hebrews 11 has already described Old and New Testament people who are faithful to God. Hebrews 11 is, is called the chapter of faith, the, hall, the hallway of faith, or something like that. And it, it's just a list of faithful people, what they did, what was done to them, and they maintain their faith in those ways. Some of those are heroes of the faith that you would know. Uh, it, it, it starts off with um, uh, Abel, and then it goes down through history, and then at the end it gets to people you never heard of, and it doesn't even mention their names. And all of these people were faithful through what they went through, right? And, and um, those are people both from the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Old Testament starts first, down to the bottom there are New Testament people. Some had scenes in their life in which their faith in God was established. Some had deaths in which they established their faith in being a Christian and dying for it. And in life and death, they were, they were believers and they were faithful. Chapter 12 starts off by saying, these faithful people are like a cloud of witnesses around you. Okay, and it surrounds believers on earth. These, this cloud of witnesses there, and and in verse 23 where we're at, Zion has pe has people there, who have faith in God. Okay, you, uh, one of the words there is church. It's the Greek word ekklesia. Uh, it has a general meaning. It means that it can describe any group of people that kind of get together for any kind of reason. Uh, when it's done like that, it's usually called an assembly. Ecclesia is an assembly. And so they could be there for political reasons. They could be there to start trouble. They could be there for all kinds of reasons, right? And, and yet there's also a more specific meaning as well. Because ecclesia can, can be the term that describes the people of God who have demonstrated faith in Christ and have experienced the, the, the whole work of the Holy Spirit. And in that sense, it's a more formal designation of church. And so ecclesia is called church in those situations. So it can be a general assembly or it can be a church. So here's the question. Does the writer mean that all saints in both the Old and New Testament are at Mount Zion? Or is this just people who trusted Christ after Pentecost? And, and because of the context, because he, uh, who he's already talked to, and because of who his audience is, I think, it's, I think it's more than evident that these are people from both covenants. People from the Old Testament who believe God, and people in the New Testament who believe God, especially in Christ, okay? And those who are faithful to God and his promises are, are this great cloud of witnesses. Now, again, firstborn can describe the Old Testament people in Exodus 4:22. It says, this is, this is God talking to Moses, and he says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. I think this is another hint that there are Old Testament believers in this crowd. Not only that, the firstborn are enrolled in heaven. Enrolled in heaven. And you kind of have to know how the Roman Empire worked. In that day, if you were a Roman citizen, and uh, you had a legitimate child, you were supposed to enroll that legitimate child with the government within 30 days of uh, the baby being born, and, when, and you would be given a document that says the child is a citizen of the Roman Empire as well. And so the child was enrolled into the empire as a citizen, right? The Bible has the same concept about heaven, and it, it predates even the Roman Empire. Back in Exodus 32, 32, Moses uses this kind of language as he's begging God for the, for, to forgive sin and save the Hebrews. He says this, but now, he, this is Moses talking to God, but now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. Moses and his life is written down in a book, and and he said, he said, if you will not forgive these people, Lord, please take me out of the book. Okay? And we will get to Exodus 32, 32. 
Lord willing, and talk more about that. But the idea is that people are registered in that way, right? And, and in our case, they're enrolled in heaven. And um, in Hebrews 12, you have, you have this idea of something being written down. If you, if you think about it, if you go to Revelation, you get the same idea with the Lamb's Book of Life, right? There are names in there enrolled of people who will come into heaven, right? So uh, verse 23 also describes the spirit of, of those, excuse me, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. These spirits are people who have been made perfect. They weren't perfect, they had to be made perfect. Now when we think of perfect, we think of God, God's the only one who's perfect, and that's right. But when it uses the word perfect here, it's talking about being whole or complete. These people are being made, have been made whole, they've been completed. Now, this is describing their spirit. Their spirit has been made like that. And this means they've died and reached the state of being heavenly, uh, in heaven, of being perfected by Christ's atonement. Upon death, believers are glorified and completed. And this is another description of the people who are at Zion. Moreover, they are righteous. They've been declared righteous by God and are made complete in heaven and where they live with celebrating angels. Now think about that. Now you kind of get the idea of what Paul's talking about when he talks about how he looks forward to his life after death, right? In Philippians 1, 23 and 24, he says, I'm hard pressed in two directions. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ. He wants to depart and be with Christ. He says, for that is much better. Right. He says, yet to remain in the flesh, to stay alive here, is better for your sake. And so he feels pushed and pulled. But the pull of heaven is greatly on him. Amen. And so there are two descriptions of the people of Mount Zion. There are the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, as well as the spirits of the righteous made perfect. But that's not who all's in heaven. So at the, at the mountain, at Mount Sinai, we have angels and we have people. But verse 23 says we've also come to God, the judge of all, right? Yep. Now we have to think in our categories a little bit. We know that God is present everywhere. He's omnipresent. That's a part of the definition of being God. God is everywhere. So there is a sense in which you cannot leave God and you cannot come to God. And yet we've already seen in Exodus 19 and 20, there are times where God manifests himself in such a way that it's unmistakable, and he will be at a place in the sense that he's not at any other place in the world. And so when he is in Mount Sinai, there's an experience that is happening that's not happening in any other place of the globe. He is centering himself there even as he is everywhere. And so while God doesn't lose his omnipotence and, and, and he's, he doesn't lose his omnipresence, the author says that at Mount Zion is the city of the living God, and when you come to Mount Zion, you come to God himself who dwells there. You are with God, right? Moreover, he's there as the judge of all. And we know from early on, God, part of who he is, is a righteous judge. Genesis 18, 25 says, far be it, this is, this is somebody speaking to God, saying, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. Right? So way back in Genesis 18, God is known as the just judge. Now you, you might think this scene just took a negative turn. Because before this, you had angels wearing festival clothes, having a good time. We've had saints from throughout history with an end to their earthly suffering. They're now complete. They're hot, now um, living their best life ever, obviously, right? And, and, and now, you throw a judge in there? That's going to sober up the party a little bit. You're wrong. You're wrong. Judges are only a threat to guilty people. <laughs> they don't impose any kind of threat on righteous people. No. In fact, judges validate the righteousness of the righteous people. These people have been called righteous. How do we know they're righteous? The judge was there and he declared them righteous. 
And, and this, is one, this is the fundamental difference, one of the fundamental differences between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. God is the judge in both places. At Sinai, the threat of the law and the threat of a holy judge brings, brings the thought of justice, it brings fear and terror. At Zion, God's justice affirms his righteous children. There's a party. Why is there terror on one mountain and celebration on the other? God, the perfect judge, is at both places. And yet it leads to two different things. Why? Two different kind of people there. There's one other person who's at the celebration of Mount Zion, and he's the one who makes the whole thing possible. Right. Verse 24 says that we come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, yeah. and to the, the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Amen. See, in both covenants, we are enemies of God, living in rebellion against him. We need reconciliation. In Exodus, it shows the Hebrews of that day assigned Moses the mediator status, and Moses should shield them from having to deal with God. Hebrews 30, excuse me, Hebrews 3, 5 says Moses was faithful in that role. Moses did a pretty good job. However, Jesus is another mediator between God and man. Amen. And Timoth 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. It's Christ Jesus. Though Moses was good, According to Old Covenant good, he was marked by failure. Yes. The New Covenant required a new mediator. And this is important. This is important. Listen to this. Moses' job, according to the people, was to keep people at a distance from God. Keep God at a distance from people. Christ does something different. Christ changes the people so they can come to God. In fact, <laughs> this is amazing. Christ is such a good mediator over the new covenant, he's actually the savior of anybody saved over the old covenant as well. Right? Hebrews 9, 5, 15 says, this gets complicated, but it says, for this reason, he is the mediator, that's Jesus, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since the death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. In other words, Jesus died for the sins, even the sins that happened under the old covenant, Jesus died, and, and those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Listen to me. The blood of of bulls and goats has never saved one person. Amen. Not one person. And all the Old Testament, all those, all those animal deaths saved nobody. When you get to heaven, all the Old Testament people, you ask, how did you get here? They're going to say, it's Jesus' blood that got me here. Scripture says Jesus is a better mediator because he's both God and man. He was born in order to complete the Old Covenant. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. Jesus accomplishes the old covenant. Yep. He is human, the only human who could live out all the covenant law from Moses in perfect obedience. Amen. Not only that, he did it while he was initiating the new covenant. He, he's the only one not born in sin. He's the only one who could do this. Amen. Moses is limited. He was a lawbreaker. Uh, Hebrews 5 says, the, 5, 3 says, the problem with the old priests is they had to sacrifice for themselves first. He, the priest, is obligated to offer sacrifices for sin as for the people, also for himself. Wow. Not so with Jesus. No, no. Hebrews 10 quotes him saying to his father, here I am. I have come to do your will, O God. Who was born with that kind of disposition? And then he does it. John 4, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And he does this by going on the cross. And on the cross, he says, it is done. Yeah, yeah. What is done? What is finished? 
Well, he completed the will of God as a suffering servant. His blood is better than all the sacrifices of all the priests. His blood is the only blood with life and grace. And when the Holy Spirit applies his sacrifice to your life, you are clean indeed. Amen. The last phrase says that the blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. Amen. When God confronts Cain over the murder of his brother in Genesis 4.10, Abel's dead. God says to Cain, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is a powerful image that says the murder of Abel has to be addressed. There's a loss, a criminal sinful loss. A brother has killed brother, fratricide. This injustice must be addressed. And then as chapter 11 lists all the faithful people and all that they did that was faithful, the first person mentioned is Abel. In Hebrews 11, 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Abel was righteous, and the fact that he bought, brought a better sacrifice than his brother did not make him righteous. But the fact that he brought a better sacrifice proved that he was righteous, he believed God. He, God accepted his sacrifice that displayed his faith. And even though he was quickly murdered, his faith is still noteworthy and still talked about. Mm. However, however, all Abel's blood is able to do is to call for justice. Mm. In Christ's shedding of blood, justice is actually accomplished. Amen. Abel is representative of all those who want justice. Their suffering, even their ultimate loss, cannot make things right. Christ, another mediator with better blood, can. Amen. So what do we do with this? Well, first of all, in this passage, I think you feel the tension that happens when people who are believers on this earth talk about end times. Because on the one hand, we have come to Mount Zion, haven't we? We have come is what it says. We have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to the angels celebrating. We have come to the saints made complete. We have come to the living God. We have come to Jesus, the better mediator. This is all in the perfect tense. We have come. We are there. And yet we await. We are not in heaven yet. We still suffer. We still need faith. We still need hope. We still have expectation. We still have opposition. We are not there yet. We are both already there and not yet there. And Christian, you've experienced some of the fulfillment of Christ's promise. But it's fulfillment, fulfillment that's short of completion. And you have to live in both of these truths because both of these things are true. You are both there and not yet there. That's what creates the pull within us. That's what creates Paul saying, it's better for you if I stay here and work, but I'd much rather be in heaven. Sure. Yeah. Secondly, I want you to think about coming to Mount Sinai and coming to Mount Zion. Throughout scripture, worship is talked about in terms of drawing near to God. Drawing near to God. Now, I'm only going to talk about Hebrews, but it's all throughout Scripture. In Hebrews 4, 16, it says, let us draw near with confidence. In 1719, Christ says, uh, it, it says, Christ brings a better hope through which we draw near to God. In 725, it says that Christ is able to save forever those who draw near to God. In 1022, it says, let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Draw near. There is something fundamentally wrong at Mount Sinai when God's people want to create distance between themselves and God. Something's wrong when Moses' job is to make sure that God doesn't get too close to the people of God. Something's wrong with that. Now, we've seen some red flags with these people before. They have not passed very many tests thus far. I'm telling you, this is another red flag. It's explainable, 
I mean, as you read it, you understand it's logical that they would feel that way. But it's not God's will that his people stand perpetually at a distance from his divine presence. And what we're starting to see in Exodus 20 is that, is that there's an accommodation made. And from this point forward, Moses will closely and carefully approach God. He enjoys being in God's presence, though he knows it's dangerous. Yet the people are always trying to stand farther and farther away. Listen, Jesus does just the opposite. He's able to change people so that they can live with a holy God. There's something to consider here in Hebrews chapter 10, 19, and 22, 19 through 22. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he's inaugurated through us, for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We are to draw near to God. Amen. There is something wrong with the people who wants to, uh, how should I put this, uh, sub-delegate their spiritual responsibilities to somebody else. To, to, to delegate their spiritual relationship to somebody else. And if you think that you relate to God or to Christ through someone else, you've delegated in a way you shouldn't. I get paid to preach, but I am not the keystone no, no. to you interfacing with God. Yeah. Christ is. Amen. And, and when you understand yourself as related to God through somebody other than Christ, there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. If your confidence is in who your spiritual leadership is on earth, there's a problem. Yeah. If your confidence is in some of your heritage that was navigated to you through other people at your old church when you were a child, there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's up to us to draw near. Right. Now this is a contrast. It's a contrast between the old and new covenants. It's to show the futility of going to Mount Sinai full of terror after being given a vision of Mount Zion in its gracious glory. Zion is where pr promises are restored and fulfilled when Christ brings all of God's people into an undivided sanctuary of Zion. Now I know you're not a Jew, who started calling himself Christian, who's thinking about going back to Judaism. That doesn't describe anybody in the room that I'm aware of. <laughs> However, I also know that over the last several years, there's been a great exodus from the church. Yeah. I also know that an actual believer could not ultimately leave Christ. I also know that leaving a church does not mean a person has left Christ. Yet I also know that people have clearly seen the Christian life tried it on for size, and then decided it wasn't for them. My question to these people is, where are you going to go? Because you don't just leave Christ. You have to go somewhere. After hearing the gospel, after seeing Christ, after seeing the promises of heaven and the growing spiritual benefit, which is much more real than anything on earth, where else can we go? but to God. Let's pray. Amen. Our Father and our God, we are again struck by the fact that you are more than we ever expected. That you are more significant, more important, and you have provided a way to yourself. We can draw near to you through Christ Jesus. Help us by faith to do that. Help us to grow in our relationship with you in our faith in you, in our commitment to you, in our obedience to you. Help us to love you, as the first great commandment says, to love you with all we have. We need help in this, and we pray that you would make the truths of these two mountains become very real in our thinking. We need help with this, and we pray for your spirit to make these things change us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We are going to go into a time of the Lord's table. I would um, 
invite you to uh, participate in this if you are a believer in Christ and have been baptized as a first demonstration of that faith, then you are more than welcome to eat at this table. There is something else that ought to hold you back and make you pause though, and that's the idea that if you have difficulty and trouble with another